Book of Linens began five years ago during my first trip to Moscow when I photographed this linen statue. He was everywhere, in the metro, on walls, hanging out with Engels and Stalin on the Arbat. Some lonely bird even found a perch atop his head. Like a good tourist, I took a few snapshots and flew home and forgot all about them. Then one day Harold called. He liked to think of himself as my agent, yeah. although in reality he was just a lowly assistant editor in some publishing house. Yeah, yeah, I photographed some linen statues. Photos? Ah, photos. Huh? I never believe it. Damn, yeah, I remember millions of them. Sure, yeah. I'll call you back in a few weeks. Yeah, see ya. That night, I tossed a few linen photos into an envelope and sent them to Harold. He needed something to humor him. Maybe it would keep him off my back as well. A few weeks later, a mysterious package arrived. A contract for a book about linen monuments. Harold's doing. I love the photos. It's a fantastic, fantastic work. I want you to get the contract in the mail. You already got your contract. You put it in the mail. You send it to me. I want it immediately. And I tell you, this work is great. I'm sitting here working a little bit. I've got the different size up going on, and this is really good stuff. But I can't tell you how urgent it is. I'm watching the news. I see what's happening in the Baltic states. I want you to get this work done. Get there. Get started. Get right away. I want these things on my desk. I read through the contract and found a $5,000 advance hidden away in there. I didn't have a job and it looked like easy money, so I thought, what the hell? I was off to the Baltic States. In Riga, hundreds of people were swarming around Lenin. I got out of Latvia and headed for Estonia, where Lenin was waiting patiently for me. Little did I suspect then that our days were numbered. I moved on to Leningrad, where you-know-who greeted me at the station. I followed his directions and ended up at the Museum of the Great October Revolution, where he'd had plenty of time to get settled in. Lenin spent three months in hiding in a straw hut on the outskirts of Petrograd. This hut, along with the monument in its shape, is perfectly preserved in the village of Roslev. I'd been reading up on this guy and knew a few of his moves. I was ready to leave Leningrad and headed for the Finnish railway station. There is a monument commemorating Lenin's return to Petrograd on the eve of the Russian Revolution. I found a ship headed for Lenin's birthplace, Ulyanovsk, and took a joyride down the Volga. When I got there, I had to climb a tree to get this shot. Not far away, I stumbled across this statue of the young Lenin, the first I had seen so far. His face beamed with the same resoluteness that had struck me in countless images of the worldly revolutionary. A bit further down the river, I spotted this one. It was by far the largest Lenin monument I'd ever seen. At last, I arrived in Georgia. The famous monument by Shadra, the most celebrated Soviet tombstone sculptor of the 30s, still stood atop the dam. I took out my trusty panorama camera and shot away. That night, 
While browsing through a picture book about Lenin, I came across the photo that must have inspired Chadra's legendary sculpture. I could almost hear Lenin's voice commanding, On my way to Siberia, I took a detour across the Caspian Sea to Turkmenistan. Unfortunately, my color film had fallen overboard along the way. This one would have sparkled. I plan to put in a special section for Asian linens. Harold's readers love such exotic stuff. I survived the trip across Siberia and could see why it was an ideal penal colony. Linen was getting harder and harder to find, and I never thought I'd have to travel this far for a couple of lousy photos. I emerged from the woods in the small East Siberian town of Shushinskoya, where Lenin had been exiled as a young troublemaker. At his former home, a samovar awaited me. My life had become one train ride after another, and my stack of linens was hardly as large as I'd expected, but it would do. I was mighty happy to arrive in Vladivostok and to find a freighter headed to the States. Surely there would be a big bonus awaiting me back home. Harold was less than pleased to see me. Rick! What are you doing here? Your present. What? Thanks, huh? I want some pictures from you. That's what. The art department is on my ass. Yeah, yeah. We need those pictures. We got a deadline. Got some Come. Nice some nice what? What's this? Wait, wait, I got a really nice one here. Where is this? Ah, check it out. Sweet. That's your, readers, all? your readers are going to love it. That's all? That's all? Yeah. You want more? We need at least 35 more pictures for this thing. Oh, come on. I've been everywhere. Look at how many. That's a lot of when, photos. When did you get back to New York? Look, have yeah, you I seen the newspaper? Understand. Have you seen what's happening here? Have you seen what's happening? These things are laying in the streets now. And this, these, that is what I want to have in my book. That man standing on his podest. And now he's laying in the street. I tell you, you are right now at the wrong place, at the wrong time. I want you back there getting this job. The linen statue I had photographed in Riga had just been torn down. There was nothing else to do but to leap back into the jungle. Harold had set me up with a real dump in Berlin, where I could take it easy until the Soviets got around to issuing me a new visa. But it wasn't long before I was reminded what I was there for. Some mysterious force drove me back to Linenplatz. The street had been renamed and I had a hell of a time finding the square. It looked like I was too late. Lenin! Lenin! Wenn's das Denkmal! Lenin! Ja, der stand hier. Hier? Ja, hier stand er, ja. Where is he? <laughs> er ist weg. <laughs> Aber hier kannst du noch sehen, wie es mal früher war. Okay. Aber ich weiß, wo er ist. Hä? Ich weiß, wo er ist. Das? Ja, der Lenin, ja. Das? I wandered aimlessly through Berlin, trying to figure out what the postcard salesman had said. Then Marx and Engels tripped me up. They didn't have to skip town.
I went to the library to look for clues where Lennon might be hiding out. Most of my teachers had found some excuse or other to avoid talking about him. I guess they were afraid our parents would think we were being indoctrinated or something. He certainly seemed to have led an adventurous life. Back home, I made a list of all my photos. I'd always thought he was just a lump of bronze or marble, but I'd clearly been mistaken. Maybe this wasn't the same statue set up in every East Block City. Maybe there really was something behind this guy. I gave them names. Checking for rain, joining the parade, giving a speech, taking off, braving the storm, leading with the people, giving a piggyback with the ride, comrades, showing off the shaking hands, hands right there, down there, no, there. No, down there. No, this, way. this way. Aside from Lennon's absence, it wasn't so bad being in Berlin. I could fantasize about all the far away places I would soon be visiting. I followed Harold's instructions and went to the Russian embassy to pick up my visa. Harold really had performed a miracle. Things were looking mighty bad in Moscow. Lenin had a broken nose. And Stalin and his pals were lying about in some park. Shortly thereafter, I wrote to Harold. Dear Harold, History isn't treating me very well. I'm striking out everywhere. Either Lenin's completely gone, or dangling from some crane. I'll keep on searching, but things are looking mighty bad. On my way back to Berlin, I finally found a Lenin. But he looked like he was about to skip town. In Leipzig, I had to change trains and had some time to kill. I dropped by the former Lennon Memorial House, which had been transformed into a furniture store. But it didn't look like the new owner had done much business. I got back to Berlin in a state of despair. It was cold and the enthusiasm of my early successes had long since given way to the reality that Lennon was disappearing faster than I could photograph him. And Harold wasn't about to back off. He wanted all the photos as soon as possible. I tossed them into an envelope, even the ones I knew he wouldn't want. He wasn't about to let some mere historical developments topple his plans. I knew I was failing and wanted to take off before Harold could catch up with me. So I escaped the miserable Berlin frost and headed to the Mediterranean, to Capri. Just when I had completely written off Lenin, I found the unthinkable. There he was, smack dab in the middle of this capitalist haunt. It could mean only one thing. I was back on the job. In Berlin, I made inquiries. The librarian told me I should head for Eisleben, where a legendary Lenin monument still stood. The Nazis had brought it back from Russia as war booty in 1943, and anti-fascists set it up on the town square shortly before the Red Army arrived two years later. It was nowhere to be seen. I asked the townspeople if they knew where it was. So that's the Museum. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Nee. Warum wurde es weggeschlagen? Ja. Ja, warum? Äh, na, weil es, glaube ich, zu alt war, also weil es nicht mehr hierher gepasst hat, weil Lenin nicht mehr in Morgen. Naja. Na gut. <lacht> Danke. Tschüss. I returned to Berlin with no more hopes of ever finding Lenin. I tried to drown my sorrows by wandering through Berlin's museums and ended up at the Museum for German History. And there he was, the Eisleben Lenin. It seems he'd been shoved off onto the museum. I photographed it from several angles, hoping I could pass it off as more than one monument. I went home not knowing how I felt. Harold was pestering me for more photos. It looked desperate this time. I went back to the library and checked out every book with linen statues I could find. I photographed everything I thought I could pass off as my own. I no longer cared about ethics or Lenin. I just wanted to get Harold off my back. I still had my ace in the hole. I looked up the postcard salesman I'd met at the former Lenin Square. He told me he knew where the Berlin Lenin statue was and he took me there. It's just a bunch of sand. Eingebuddelt. I started digging. Last, I found him. Must be his head. Yeah, that's the same one. I packed my bags and headed for the airport. He was mighty glad to see me, but not the photos. Oh, Vic, come and sit down here. This is nice. Look at this work we're doing here, right? Mm -hmm. Very nice work. This is the first 
First press, what do you think? Good work. Got all our things down. Now I want the pictures. Give me the pictures. That's what we're waiting for. That's the big deal. I can get on the phone, art department, we've got the press going. I want to see these things here. Let me look at them. It's, uh, what are we doing here? Look at this. No. See this? See this? That's the head? And they buried it. And we dug it up six feet There's, underground. Wait a minute. There's six feet underground. We can't, we can't use any of this stuff. Yeah. Great shot. This Great is shot. not this is not the book we're doing. Yeah. This, is, this is reality. This is reality. This Harold. is not hey, I don't want this. This is what's stop. happening, man. Look, they're lying around. The statues are just lying wait around. Wait a minute, wait, wait. Look at this. Hey. What are you doing here with me? Well, we got we got a deadline here. What the f It looked like I was in big trouble. Here. Hey, you I got out of there as fast hey. as I could. Hey, we got we got the press foreman. Press foreman. I want to know um, how's the linen book? Is it is in the press? Stop the presses right now. <laughs> Some time later, this book started popping up around New York. I guess I shouldn't have left all those photos on Harold's desk after all. Yeah.